This is episode number 208 featuring the amazing painter Mike Hernandez. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Well, thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome, everybody, to the Plein Air Podcast. The Plein Air Podcast has been rated the numero uno, number one in Feedspot's 2021 Top 15 uh, Painting Podcast list. Thank you for that. Thank you for making it happen. Welcome, everybody, and... Um, Welcome to March. Last year at this time, I was in Russia shooting a documentary and shooting two art instruction videos with one of the top Russian masters, Nikolai Blokhin, which are amazing. Anyway, uh, I've got some really wonderful memories of that trip. I got to meet the heads of the Serikov and the Repin Art Institutes, the two biggest and probably most important art schools in the world. And also had the um, got to meet the heads of the top museums there. Uh, it was really wonderful. The Russian painting is just so wonderful. Uh, it was cold. I got to paint, but it was cold. And I'm going to be back in September, God willing, with a group of about 50 people who are going with me to Russia. The painting trip at paintrussia.com is sold out, but there is a waiting list just in case we can open some more seats. So we'll hope so. We'll hope so, but you never know. Last week, we had record numbers of people signing up for Plen Air Live, our online summit with top artists. We got a, a big, big lineup of really amazing artists. You should check it out. Anyway, oh, there's still um, some more big artists to be announced, and you can save some money still if you sign up at plenairlive.com. This is a perfect thing for spring training, getting you ready and tuned up for your best painting over the summer. Uh, if, of course, travel is allowed, of course, you can still go out and paint, but um, it's a good time. Great chance to really learn from the masters. And there's a beginner's day for people who want to learn the ropes on plein air painting, learn all about the equipment and all the other things that you've got to learn and understand. That is at plenairlive.com. Now, this is the final month, the last month, the end of the year when it comes to the annual plein air salon. We normally award the awards at the plein air convention, which has been canceled this year. So the last chance to enter is March 15th. It's a short month. Uh, we just ended the other competition. The awards are about to be announced for that, but the March competition is ending on the 15th because we have to have plenty of time to get the annual awards figured out and get them ready. And we're gonna present them on the plein air live broadcast. And so, uh, you want to be part of that. Uh, and there's a cover of Plein Air Magazine and $15,000 in cash up for grabs and many, many more cash prizes. We do only cash prizes, all cash prizes, no no uh, pretend prizes. Anyway, uh, pleinairsalon.com is where you go before March 15th. We've got a new video out, by the way, with last year's winner, Dave Santiani's, and uh, you should check that out at streamline.art. All right. It's hard to believe this, but this issue of Plein Air Magazine is going to be the 10-year anniversary issue. One of them we're celebrating all year. This is an article on that first feeling. Viewers often struck by uh, Tiffany Mang's choice in materials, gouache, digital, and the medium is not the message. This California Painters has many things to say, and you want to check that article out. Also, uh, in Plein Air Today, our newsletter, a glimpse of our Plein Air heritage as we focus on the artist Stanilope Forbes, which you're going to love and his philosophy on plein air painting or nothing. Well, that's kind of how I feel. Well, kind of, kind of. Anyway, coming up after the interview, I'm going to be answering your art marketing questions in the Art Marketing Minute. But let's first get to our interview with plein air painter and former production designer for DreamWorks Animation. It's Mike Hernandez. Mike Hernandez, welcome to the plein air podcast. Hi, Eric. Thanks for having me on. We Good are to hear from you. Very excited about this. Uh, you and I have done some projects together. Uh, you did a, a live workshop uh, here in Austin online. We've done some videos together. And uh, you've got an incredible um, background and career. And so we're going to dig into that today. 
All right, that sounds good. So where do you want to start? What, uh, when did this whole interest in, in art begin for you? For me, you know, it's weird to kind of, I don't know. I, I kind of grew up in a family of art. My father used to work for the aerospace industry. He worked for Northrop, and he was a commercial artist. So mm-hmm. he did most of his work, obviously. Yeah, he did most of his work at, you know, uh, at the studio. But um, he also had his own little room that my brother and I would break into, you know, just about almost every day, you know, and break into his markers. And back then they had some of the most toxic, but incredible colors you could ever use. We were getting high up all the bad stuff, but um, we broke into the markers. We broke into all the colored pencils and, you know, we were looking at my dad, you know, he had these beautiful uh, duotone gouache paintings up on, you know, his wall of, you know, test flight simulation type scenarios that he was painting for Northrop and, advertisements and illustrations and so we would kind of copy them to see if we can replicate what my dad was doing so at some point my father found us like years later he kind of knew we were getting into stuff and kind of scolded us lightly because i think he liked that we took an interest to it um and i was always a kid in high school that went that extra mile with the peachy folder drawovers you know and uh other students would come up to me and ask if i would do a little bit more work on their peachy folders and then of course um the desk was always a, a fun thing. You know, I had teachers who, you know, got me in. I was in a lot of trouble for drawing on my desk quite a bit. <laughs> However, they couldn't help but, you know, take interest in some of the things that were on that desk. Like, you know, that's pretty, pretty cool stuff. You know, so it wasn't what, until what, I got to like. What kind of things school, were you drawing on, on your desk? It was, you know, were, were oh, there characters um, or. You know what? Um, gosh, I don't even remember now what it was. It, it must have been, you know always figurative things like faces, you know, it was, I was never into like character, right? My, yeah. ima- my imagination never went further than reality at that point. It wasn't until I got into, you know, the industry later, but at that, at that age, it was all about, I like eyeballs. So I might draw an eye, you know, and I'll focus on the iris and making the iris look really cool. And then, you know, I haven't, when I was at home, I tried to figure out how to draw a hand. And if I, I was onto something when I got to school, I got lazy. I'd start continuing on the sketchbook or I would start, it would go from the sketchbook off the sketchbook and continue on to the desk. Or there might've been a girl that I was liking and she was, you know, kind of attractive and and I had a secret crush on her and I would maybe draw pictures of her profile from a distance. Kind of creepy. Right. But that's kind of what I was doing as a kid. That's the kind of stuff. That's what seventh graders do. So did your dad, um, your dad was an illustrator. Did he ever at any point say, Hey, let me show you how to do some stuff. He did, you know, he did, uh, eventually, you know, come in and, you know, I remember one of the biggest hints of advice he gave me when I was struggling with, you know, how to draw landscapes from photographs or mountains. And he said, you know, put blue in everything. And I said, but dad, I don't see blue in that part. And that part, he goes, trust me, it's in there, especially when it's a landscape, blue is inherent in everything. And I didn't know what he meant by that time at the time, but I went ahead and said, okay, and, you know, I started putting more blue in my paintings, which is contradictory to what I teach nowadays. I always tell students, you know, not to put too much blue into their, their landscapes because it tends to flatten it out. Um, well, well I'm, curi- I'm curious then. What, so you've, you've learned that that's not necessarily the right advice, but it was at the time. At the time, it was the right advice because I was using too much uh, muddy color. Basically, you know, I think my dad, what he was trying to say is mix your colors, you know, mix more colors than what seems obvious. If there's a building in the distance or a rock and it looks brown, you know, it's not just white with brown. You might consider putting a little bit of blue or another color or green or something to it to to give it a variation of that color. Um, And so that was a profound message he gave me when I was a kid, you know, and so I started incorporating more blue into areas I didn't think had it which is interesting. So now when I teach class, a lot of times that, that is a note I'll give students. For example, they'll have the sunlight hitting the dirt and these guys are using straight white with yellow ochre. But what they're forgetting is that we've got that whole canopy above our head of blue sky, you know, that big blue canopy. And when the sun isn't directly overhead and it's at an angle, well, that canopy blue has, you know, it, it has an effect as it filters through all the warm rays it kind of mixed through that at a three quarter angle and it it has an effect on the sunlight of the, the temperature of the sunlight, the color of the local, uh, the local color of the object it's hitting. 
and some of the blue that comes through uh, and, and mixes with that. And I'm, then that's something I've kind of started to teach students. And then whenever I teach that, I tell students, you need to put a little bit of blue in there. You know, maybe you make, you warm up the blue by adding, you know, ochres and things to it, but the blue's in there. Um, and then I'll recall what my dad said. It wasn't until much later in life. I was like, oh, I, I guess that's what my dad meant by, you know, put blue in everything. Well, you, you know about, um, you know about bluing agent. No, but, I don't. Well, blue, uh, back, uh, back in the day, I don't know what, what day that was, but you know, the, to make whites look whiter, they put blue in it. Right. That is, that is, I didn't know what that was called. I didn't know there was a term for it, but I do recall, you know, for me when I'm doing paintings, when I get to the highlight, especially if it's a warm object that needs a highlight, the whiter it goes, uh, the higher it didn't, the intensity didn't seem to be quite as bright. So I would usually tickle it with a little bit of green and blue or a touch of magenta and blue in the white, just to kind of feel it vibrate a little bit to see if it'd separate as a highlight. So it's actually a interesting term. Yeah, well, there you go. Bluing agent. I don't know. Probably wish you Bluing all... agent. Bluing okay. agent is what I remember. And and I remember from laundry back in the, you know, when I was a kid, that that they'd, they would always touch, put it, you want your whites whiter? Well, we have bluing agent in our, in our laundry detergent. They still probably put it in there. You know, if you look at Tide, Tide comes out blue. So maybe there's something to That's that. That's true. Maybe it's a, a, a it little is, touch of dye of some sort. Yeah, if you look at your blue scales, and, and this was actually something I had taught students and without even knowing it was called blue agent. But uh, I, I, a lot of notes I've, I've given recently for students painting buildings that appear pure, pure white. I'll tell them the only reason that that building looks pure white is because it has blue in it. Uh, and the rest of the landscape around it is very warm. And then if you have a building that has a cooler tint of white to it, it appears cleaner. It is going to appear whiter as opposed to just caking as much white as possible, if you tint that little bit of blue into that building without having to go all the way to white, because that's always something I always try to avoid is going 100% white or 100% black. You just kind of lose color completely or you go flat or eclipse. Yeah. Um, stay within values. You know, I said, if that building looks like it's screaming white, um, it might, you know, you might be able to get that same effect by, re you know, creating a contrast of a darker color next to it and then putting a little bit of blue in that white or that gray, make it a cool gray and it'll still stay white. Huh. That's terrific. Well, you, you know, you teach color and you teach uh, composition and you teach a lot. So let's go back and let's finish this, um, this uh, biography part of this. And then we're going to go into a little the evolution. Bit yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're, um, you're, you're doing some stuff in school and you're getting in trouble for writing on the desks and, and putting pictures <laughs> of pretty girls on the desks. So, and the, Getting a bad reputation. <laughs> and and never uh, once in any of that time did I feel like I was going to be an artist at all. Really? It was always hobby. It was always just for fun. You know, even in high school, I was I got the reward for being the best artist in the school. But I never thought, well, that's that's my that's my uh, career. I'm going to be an artist someday. I never thought about any of that. I never considered it. Even thought, even though well, that's what really your dad do hobby. did for a living. Exactly. And again, the only reason I did what he did is because, you know, it was, it was the coolest thing. I respected my father, you know, and I respect my father with the, you know, with the greatest and to see what he does. It's like, wow, I want to do what he does. So not necessarily do what he does for a living, but I just want to do what he's doing and yeah. it looks interesting and it's creative. Yeah. But high school was, high school was just, again, rewards after rewards and, and awards after awards. And, uh, uh, but never an inkling to do something artistic in, in, in the, um, professional sense. And, you know? and no art, art teacher at our, at school ever said, Hey, you know, you can make a living doing this. Um, I recall that there were probably discussions like that. And for me, it was just like, yeah, I'm probably going to be an astronaut though, you know, or <laughs> I'm probably going to, I'd rather do something, you know, a little more in, in, in depth, like, you know, create automobiles or something like that, which of course there was no chance on hell I had, I was ever going to do anything like that. But I, I think my aspirations at the time when I, when after high school finished, I just kind of dropped out, you know, and I just, I didn't do anything for a few years except for rock climb. You know, I, I became just like an avid sport, uh, rock climb and I would spend many, many years in Yosemite climbing the faces of, of the rocks and, and spending, you know, spending nights up on a little, you know, uh, ledge sleeping up there. So 
that kind of became um, the norm for me was just climbing. Well, you're my hero. I, that's, that's pretty incredible to be able to do that. The Thanks. only reason I did it is because I grew up with a fear of extreme heights. It was always my fear. And what the fear of height taught me was that whenever you have that fear, let's say you almost fell or you're looking over the edge, you ever notice just how much, how much fright you get? Well, that fright also is, is because of the, the amount of energy in the intensity in that moment. You could actually channel that intensity uh, in your favor as opposed to against you. So for rock climbing, I ended up doing that. Of course, I did everything with ropes, you know, and protection, but um, I learned that there was a lot of energy in the fear. And if you learned how to channel it correctly, you can use it to motivate you as opposed to bring you down. But because I was out in nature all the time, I kind of felt like there was always that connection to nature. You know, the colors, the light, the atmosphere, um, all of that stuff, the organization of, of things. I was always connected to it. And it always brought me back to art because even when I was rock climbing, I was I still had a sketchbook and I still drew all the time, you know. And it kind of went like this. Um, so rock climbing days, and at some point I needed to make money. So then I went to go work for um, a cable company called, uh, I think at the time they were Com they're Comcast now, but they were Charter Cable Communications back then. I worked I for that company about, too. You know, oh, did you really? I, it wasn't Charter Cable, but, but it was Charter. It was a broadcasting company. Yeah. Yeah. So we had it as Charter Communications Cable Company in Alhambra. And I was the, you know, I was a, a, an audit, a, a poll auditor, which was I would go up and audit uh, cable theft. So my job was to put on these uh, these metal spikes uh, on, on um, they're called gaffs. And you put these metal gaffs and you wrap around your ankles and your, and your, your boots. And you gaff up your, these phone poles. I had to be certified to do it. And the only reason I was drawn to do it is because I was, I loved climbing things. I was a rock climber. Of course. <laughs> so I was gaffing poles, you know, and, I, and anytime there was another person who was too terrified, because it was a dangerous job. Someone was terrified to go up a pole to go check to see if there was a line connected that was illegally tapped in. That was my job, by the way, as an auditor, was to see if that line was still hot. And if it was still hot, it might have been that maybe somebody for, you know, another tech person was lazy and didn't disconnect it after the customer decided they didn't want it. So that way, when somebody moves into an apartment, let's say, for example, and they say, oh, what's that line? They plug it into their TV and get free cable and say, I didn't know it came with free cable. It didn't. It's just that the guy, the tech didn't go up. Or a tech sold an illegal box to somebody and then went up and connected it for them. Or you had the, the, the worst ones were just people who would maybe uh, take the wire and they would fray it and they would they would just shove it in they would climb up and uh risk their life and just shove it into the darn port and get a legal cable so there was there was a big job for me and a few other people to do that we'd go to cities and just climb these poles all day long and disconnect the illegal cable service uh all the time and then try to see if we could sell them on legitimate cable and make money and we'd get profits from it but it kept me climbing all the time and then i so i started getting further and further away from the thought of ever doing art because there was an inkling in a time after climbing and sketching all the time out there. So I thought, you know, I was always good at art. You know, maybe I could do something with it. Who knows? You never know. But then I started getting into the cable company, and it didn't seem like it was a career choice. It just felt like this is what I was going to do uh, for a little bit, and then maybe, I'd, maybe I would reconsider art again. But then came, you know, uh, the apartment and the, the car and responsibilities, and before you knew it, I was like, you know, I was getting married, and so – okay, well, maybe this could be my career. I'm going to be a cable tech. I'm not going to be an artist. And so I embraced it. But it took this one day where I was gapping up a foam pole, and it was a big one. It was a 90-foot foam pole. 90-foot? Uh, and a 90-foot foam pole. And those aren't normally the height of these poles. They're usually not that high. But this one was really high. And I'm gaffing up this pole with all the confidence in the world, you know, just boom, boom. And these gaffs, by the way, these little metal spikes, they're only about – an inch and a half to two inches long, but they only go into the foam pole about maybe a quarter of an inch. And yeah. it's based on angle, right? right? If your angle's off, you slip. And you're not, you're holding on with your arms. And it isn't until you get to the very top where you're going to do your work that you take a belt from around your waist and put it around the pole and clip it to your belt again and lean out. So you're still not that, you could still fall down. Um, so it was a pretty dangerous job. So I was doing that one pole and I was getting up there and I had a friend down below who was watching me. We always had a lineman down below. And I get to the top of that pole just about, and I'm ready to secure, and I gaff, and I hit a part of the pole that was just deteriorated. We call it cinnamon stick. And it just deteriorated, and I fell, and my hand reaches up, and luckily I'm at 
one of the tension wires up there. And luckily it wasn't a hot uh, electric wire and it's the phone wire and I'm grabbing it and I'm struggling and it's 90 feet down. If I fall, it's over. And I'm panicking about, Oh my God, what am I going to do? You know? And so my, my guy down below was like, should I call a truck? And I didn't know what to do. And I barely got my feet over the wire and clipped myself in and I'm hanging there suspended and I'm safe for the moment. <laughs> But I did say, get the bucket truck guys over here and have them get me down. I'm a little shooken up. But while I was up there, I started thinking to myself, what am I doing up here? I wanted to be an artist. <laughs> That's... I want to be an artist. I, I wanted to paint for a living. I wanted to go to art school, not do this. This isn't worth it. I mean, if I'm going to die yeah, doing something, I'm going to die at something I love. It better be that I die because I ate too much cadmium orange or something. <laughs> not falling off a, pole, a phone pole. That's not worthy of my time. You know, or death by paintbrush, <laughs> whatever it is. I'd rather do something more legit. Well, well, you often that. hear stories about dangerous. people have clarifying moments. That, that that was a near death experience, and clearly a clarifying moment. Absolutely, you know, and I did. After that, um, I was so terrified that I wouldn't get the chance to, you know, because then I made up my mind at that moment. I'm going to go to art school. I'm going to, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to get loans. I'm going to get scholarships. I'm going to go to art school. I'm going to somehow quit this job and get out of it. But I I gave him a month, you know, obviously that I was going to leave, but I was so terrified that within that month, because I was so shooken up from that near fall that within that month, I'm going to fall again and I'm not going to get my chance. So they all understood and they laughed. And it was a good thing. My boss saw my potential as an artist because I was always the guy that said, make us posters here at the, at the, uh, the office. And they always like, you should be doing art for a living. And so I, uh, you know, I, he understood and respect my, you know, what I wanted to do. He, so he kind of laughed about it. He said, I'll put you on light duty. You drive the truck, you know, and you hand the stuff. And I left the company and I got a scholarship to go to art center. Uh, and it got me, you know, almost half the coverage for school. And before you knew it, I, I, I graduated, uh, top of the class and, and distinction and, uh, was ready to to do art in the field. You know, it was all up from that point. Well, Art Center has a great reputation. And who did you study with there? Vern Wilson. He was one of my favorites. Um, I remember him from the beginning. I mean, there was almost all the teachers at that time. You know, they were just. You know, I, I gotta say, in some in some form or another, were all my favorites. You know, Vern Wilson for head drawing. I remember his ability to just kind of wet and blot Arch's paper and then know where to put the dry marks for the lines when he's drawing faces and know where to put the blot where it needed to bleed. I could never understand that. It was just a, an intuition that he would do. But I loved that class. You know, I thought I was going to be a figurative artist because I was just, you know, like I said, when I was a kid drawing on desks, it was always figurative, eyeballs, hands, feet. Uh, um, and then I really embraced that when I got to art school. It was all about anatomy, taking anatomy classes and figure painting Never thought about animation, never thought about environmental design. Fine art was kind of my thing. You know, I studied under Ray Turner for quite some time. And, you know, I think he had the biggest impression on me when it came to expression of color. You know, I thought everything I studied prior to that, which you should, you know, when you're you're studying your, your basics in art school, should be all about the academics of color, right? You know, A plus B should equal C, meaning blue plus orange should equal complement gray. All of those things added up. You know, if you take white and gray at this percentage, you'll get that number. And I thought, okay, well, I need to learn the grammar of art first. So I did that. But when I took Ray Turner's class, it wasn't about A plus B equaling equaling C. It was like A plus B equals whatever it is you want it to be. Um, And, you know, he taught me a whole new method to how to use color. And his method, you know, he taught both head painting and he taught a landscape painting class. He taught the first ever landscape painting class at art center where you would actually go out in location uh, um, and paint. But at the time I I first took his head painting class. And what I loved about it is he didn't mix on the palette. He mixed on the canvas. So he would just take gobs and gobs of color and load his brush up and slap it onto the canvas and just start mixing onto the canvas and taking risks. And so I thought, you know, I want to take this guy as an independent study, you know, to see what I can gain. So after his head painting class, I took an independent study with him and, you know, we did, you know, uh, I remember he gave us this, uh, this assignment where he's like, go to that wood, uh, go to the tool crib at, at the um, uh, the school where they cut all the wood, wood block and all that. And there's a trash bin of all the leftover wood scraps. I want you to grab all that stuff 
and I want you to paint them all with gesso and prep them. And then I want you to just do, you know, as many head studies as you can, you know, in oil. And then, uh, so, and he gave me just a stack of black and white photos to paint from that he uses. And so I started painting and, and inventing color. And uh, I would come back to him and he says, yeah, you're still just going too literal. You know, you're, it looks like you're just trying to like, this is skin tone and, and this. And he goes, and I want you to take more risks. And I would come back and he'd say, that's better, but it's not enough. So then what he would do is scrape a, with his palette knife. He'd go to his dirty palette, his big glass palette. And all the mud left over that he was about ready to throw away, he just took a big scoop of a, a couple of scoops of that and he threw it on my palette and he sent me home. He said, paint with that. <laughs> <laughs> And so it was with that much amount of paint, it was a bit of painting and sculpting, but then you learn a lot of things from those beautiful mixed colors. The further away you get from those primary colors, the more interesting the subtleties become. And then you could react off those things with using more saturated colors against them and then in proportions and then within hierarchies. And then you realize, oh, it's not about literally what you see in front of you. That's art. It's about the relationships of color and how color works when one color uh, is uh, put in proportion to another and the hierarchies of those. So then he taught me that just because landscape shows you that warm colors are in the sunlight, cool colors are in the shadow, doesn't mean you have to do that. You have to counterbalance and balance it to make sure that it's appealing to the eye. Uh, and nature is a good place to start, but it's not the end all. You can kind of break all those rules and make your rules. There are no rules but there's good footnotes to start with, right? You want your academics and then after that. So Ray Turner was really great uh, when using color. Another artist I studied under was uh, Donald Put Putman. You know, he's, he's passed on now, but he was a West Southwest artist as well. And he taught me color, you know, that was, you know, he taught me the amped up version of color, which was to use a lot more saturation, but to take risks and say, you can use blue for skin tone if you'd like, or green for skin tone. And then I remember I spent quite some time doing very overly colorful paintings and using a lot of purples and magentas, things I was never taught to do when I was in school. Art Center taught you, you got your burn umber, yellow ochres, you know, I forget what they call that, but what is it, the, the, the palette, um, not the Zorn palette, was it? Well, I don't know, the dead, dead mostly color. Mostly like earth tones, you yeah. know, mostly like earth tones with one blue or something, Yeah. which is a beautiful palette. Like I, I, I will sometimes revert to that palette to then, kind of you know remind myself that colors don't have to be so sweet but i got to a point where the colors were so sweet and then i ended up having to come back and dial it in but artists like that were fantastic you know I bet, uh, but every artist i had at art center contributed in many ways i mean one example would be i don't remember her name unfortunately and she'd kill me if she heard this but um she taught letter form and letter form was one of the classes that gave me a lot of discipline on how to actually create a letter type without using a computer and without using any rulers or edges or, or French curves. By hand, you had to draw out the letter form or an alphabet or write a word and then paint it in with a paint called Plotka paint, black and white. And it had to be ready like camera ready when it's done. It had to be perfect. So it taught me a little bit about control and elegance. So every class had its thing that contributed to where I got today, you know. Hmm. So you, uh, in one of those classes you mentioned, you started going outdoors. So that must have been the first plein air experience. That was, you know, I never did paint outdoors. I always sketched outdoors. I never painted. So um, I decided and the only reason I took it was because I thought it was going to be a nice break, you know, from indoor classes, you know, so when, you know, a, a couple of other buddies said, Hey, let's take it together so we can all camp out because it was basically three weekends for the whole term. You go out on a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday and paint and camp out with, you know, uh, Ray Turner and, and learn some landscape painting. And then that turned out to be one of the most pivotal classes I ever took. You know, I took a big interest to outdoor painting, you know, because that's when I realized, well, all the colors, you know, that you take for granted in photographs, they're all out here in nature and they're different. They don't look the way they do in photographs. You know, uh, and it's a, it's a different ball game when you're painting from life as opposed to a photograph. When you're painting a photograph, you know, you don't get the scope and scale of that environment. You don't feel the atmosphere or smell what it smells like, or you don't get the sense of culture in that environment that you get from maybe the people or the animals that were there. All kinds of things bleed into the experience of being present in the moment, uh, and it has an impression on what that artwork is going to look like. 
when you're there, you know, were you there at that landscape early in the morning? Well, then your impression of what it feels like to be up that early, the cool air, that kind of lighting, uh, all of that, and the culture of where it was you were painting all leads into the results of what you're going to learn. I didn't realize that until, you know, I got into the animation industry and they're asking me to paint like, a, hey, do a color key for a very sad morning in Europe. I'm like, well, I have to look up other artists who've maybe done that to try to see if I can get a reference. Or if you painted, or you can kind of draw from life experience, right? Uh, to find out, well, maybe what was it like for me to be either in Europe if I've ever painted there? Or what is that culture like and how does it have an impression on the colors or when you're there talking to the people or seeing other artists there, how do they paint that culture and what is it like or how to pass artists? So plein air painting opened up a paradox of possibilities for what it meant to be outdoors uh, in the culture and expose yourself to the environment that you're going to paint as opposed to looking in a window of a photograph to paint from it. How did you end up uh, in the animation that was one industry? Of the so that was interesting. Um, graduated art center with a lot of debt and you know thank god for all of those um all of the the scholarships and the grants and those helps but yeah i was still left with a healthy debt and needed to get a job and again didn't think that i was going to get into animation i'm thinking that most of my career here my career path has in, in college was fine art fine art uh figurative and painting and that was my portfolio and some charcoal sketches with no environment no perspective maybe one perspective drawing but Mostly fine art-ish looking things, expression of the body and, and the head and the face. And I had friends who recently graduated Art Center and they were working at Disney and they were working at DreamWorks. And, you know, I was talking to them and I was, you know, saying, you know, hey, I got a lot, I got quite a bit of debt, you know, are they hiring over there? And they kind of chuckled and said, yeah, but I don't know if your portfolio is kind of what they're looking for. You need environmental stuff, you need set design, you know, you need some cinematic background and I didn't have any of those things but I took a risk anyway and I said what I got to lose so back in 98 I uh, or 99 I submitted a portfolio to DreamWorks and funny things I, I got I got in <laughs> but not only did I just get in I didn't even get in at the entry level I got in at the kind of almost, not really the top the top would be production designer art director but I got in in visual development and it's different back then than it was today back then back in the 90s you know, visual development was a small department of like maybe 10 artists who were the top of the chain, the food chain there, who've already paid their dues in the layout department, the background painting department, you know, or the, uh, um, the uh, uh, rough layout department or character design. They've kind of already paid their dues in all those departments. And so now they can be a visual development artist. Those are the artists that basically are in charge before anything gets made they work with the director and the, and the script writer and the and the producers and they start coming up with visions for what the show will look like and then once their visions get brought off on they start to then hire or they send that work off to the the uh production team who then go into production the visual develop those artists then turn into the rough layered artist cleanup so for me i got all the way up there to that and i didn't know what it meant and i remember my first meeting it was with uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg at the time. And I was just wondering, what am I doing in a room with Jeffrey Katzenberg and all these other artists? And they were pitching something for a show called Sinbad. And they had these amazing oil paintings, which is unheard of for visual development these days. Usually everything's digital. There was these over the top, massive from wall, you know, from the, the ceiling to floor paintings, oil paintings or charcoal sketches that were massive and gorgeous. Uh, just visions of what the movie Sinbad could look like and all this gorgeous lighting. And I'm thinking, is this the job that they got me into? They think I can do this? <laughs> Went back into my room and curled up into a little fetal position in fear. <laughs> I don't belong in this position. I spoke, and then it turned out later, one of the, the lead artists, you know, was, you know, I, uh, I'd come to respect him so much now because I, now I, I understand what he was trying to tell me, but he said, you know, I saw your portfolio and I, I, I wasn't one of the people who wanted you for that position, but it was the producers for some reason that thought you had the chops and thought you should be here. And, but I don't think, I think you need to be in another, I, you, you need to kind of work from the bottom up, you know? And so I was determined after hearing that and I decided, you know, so what they did is they said they were going to get rid of me because it's not going to work out. Apparently maybe, maybe the producers, you know, and uh, maybe they shut off 
half cannon on that and they went a little bit too far. And so they thought, okay, well, we made a mistake, but you have three months. So decide what you want to do before we let you go. So what I did is I went to the layout department, which was, you know, one of the more entry level departments where they were, you know, after the visual development process was done at the time they were working on El Dorado and they were already painting the backgrounds or they were drawing the backgrounds. I begged some of those artists like, you know, look at my portfolio. What is it I need? And, and a couple of them were really cool and said, well, this is what I would do. And so I just did, I started doing what they were doing. I'd go back in my office. I had nothing to work on. So I did these background drawings. I did sketches. And uh, after about two weeks, I then started showing these sketches to some of the other layout artists. And they're like, that's kind of cool, but I would do this and this. And then eventually I took it up to the head of the layout department and I showed him the work and he just kind of smiled at me. He gave me a big smile and he says, you know, I don't know what to tell you. You know, they were at a crux at that time in the studio. They were ready to lay off a lot of their departments of people who've been there for quite some time. And here I am, a new person trying to get in while they're going to be laying off a whole bunch. He said, you know, if the timing was different, I think you'd be great for this position. I just don't know what to tell you. But other people got involved and, you know, they saw the potential of what I was doing. And for some reason, I made the cut uh, after that. You know, the, and the layouts were only because they were starting to move towards 3D. Uh, films and they were gonna they were gonna break away from 2D animation. So I made the cut and I eventually made it in. And from there, the story just went on. I, I was a layout artist for a few years. Then I was the sequence designer. Then I got my first break when and I actually got to art direct a, a, a TV show, um, our first animated 3D TV show, and I was art director on that. And, and what, from what there, was the I show? just kept going. It was called. <laughs> nobody will know what it, that show is anymore. It was the Siegfried and Roy uh, uh, show. Uh, it was the uh, Father of the Pride. Not Father of the Bride, but Father <laughs> of the Pride. And it was an NBC TV show, and it was supposed to be huge. Uh, and, you know, it was it was the biggest thing for me about working on that show, not only was the fact that I got to, you know, that was my first shot at actually, you know, art directing something, but I got to meet Siegfried and Roy. You know, we went to Vegas, and I met the two guys. And Roy is just probably one of the most fantastic people I've ever met in my life. Such a sweet, really caring guy. And I totally can tell that he was absolutely into what he did. He was so vibrant. Um, but it wasn't, unfortunately, just, you know, months after that, we got into production. He had that accident and, you know, his, you know, got bitten by a tiger on his throat. You know, and of course, today he's deceased from, from that wound. But um, that kind of dampered a little, you know, uh, that put a damper on the show. You know, it was a little bit weird. Um, and that wasn't maybe the only thing. I think the other thing that was kind of, uh, working against us was, I guess our time slot was, you know, kind of up in a time slot that was more less family, more adult. So maybe, maybe that had something to do with, it. I don't know, but you, as you know, I think a lot of people know when you're going into this industry, everything's a crapshoot. You give it a shot, you see if it's going to work and it either does or it doesn't. But I had a lot of fun working on that show. It was a blast. And in fact, some of the people who worked on that show, are actually some of the bigger names, you know, in the animation industry right now, who've kind of made it, made their way uh, uh, up the ladder. Some of them are now directors, and they're art directors, and, and uh, production designers, and, and head of layout. You know, we all worked on that show from the bottom because it was a TV pipeline that was more aggressive than a feature pipeline, and we learned a lot from it. Well, and and, and, and when you're in a more aggressive timeline like that, you ha you you have to learn to get things done fast. Yeah. Right. And I think and I think that's what contributed to the success of a lot of the people is they were they were put under this uh, pressure of being able to to produce feature level quality for TV, TV budget and a TV time frame. And, and of course, we you know, we tried our best to try to hit that. Um, and I think we did a pretty good job of getting a certain level of quality in there. But of course, it wasn't feature level quality, but it was pretty good quality at the time. You know, for given the constraints we had, given the time frame we had and the budgets we had, we it looked pretty good. It, it was pretty fantastic, you know, and it was actually really funny. I mean, there was a lot of really funny moments on that show. But again, like I said, I just I got to meet really great people and I got to uh, uh, learn a lot of valuable uh, um, uh, artifacts within uh, within that type of, uh, um, of pipeline. So it helped propel me to other jobs. You know, from there, I got to do art directing on, on, on I became an art director on Shrek 4. Loved working on that film. You know, I got to 
start off as production designer on other shows, and then some of those shows might get canceled. Then I went on to art directing other things. I directed some TV specials for DreamWorks, and it's been like uh, one of the funnest journeys I've ever spent working for that studio. They're fantastic people. They make some of the best uh, work in the industry. Um, if I ever ever have the chance to work with them again, it's the absolute pleasure. I had the uh, the pleasure of of seeing Jeff Katzenberg at the one of the original TED conferences, uh, where he revealed uh, a little bit of footage from Shrek. Uh, they ha- they were just I think Shrek was the first film that they did at DreamWorks, wasn't it? Um, Shrek wasn't the f- was it their first film? Gosh, you know, and I think about it, no Shrek was the first 3d film first 3d we ever did, okay. and that was at our yeah it was at our pdi facility up in uh san mateo uh i think san mateo up there up there in the bay area you know we had that that pdi studio that eventually got shut down a few years back but the pdi studio was basically where we did uh all of our 3d films because we didn't have that kind of facility at the uh, the glendale facility so yes that was our first 3d film ever made but our first ever film i believe was um prince of egypt hmm okay all right yeah. perfect so uh let's move into the, the the world today you you have kind of um made a decision to morph into a uh, kind of a full-time position as an artist um i mean you were a full-time position as an artist but as a fine artist working on your gallery works now is that right yeah yeah for sure and again i always consider myself you know uh having a having a foot in, in both worlds, you know, the entertainment industry and the fine art industry or the contemporary art industry or the plein air, you know, just a foot in both worlds has proven to be more beneficial for me than I ever imagined. You know, I, yeah. I leverage so many things off of both sides, you know, from my cinematic point of view, the things I learned about cinema and animation and storytelling and how to be intentional, you know, uh, and, and economical because we only have but seconds sometimes to get people to get the essence of what's on screen. Uh, to sell emotion uh, and be creative, that's lent itself in, in so many ways to plein air painting. You know, I think if I never did that, you know, I think I'd be more of a literal type of painter where I'd go out and plain, paint a plein air painting, but just try to color match everything and, and not cheat anything and not push the composition too much. But that's not to say people who don't work in entertainment industry who are just plein air painters don't do that. I mean, there's all kinds of amazing painters in that industry in the plein air industry who do that who are cinematic and they never they've never had a foot in the cinema world but they just know how to push color and imagination i just wasn't one of those people so i think it was great that i had the leverage of the entertainment field teach me something about storytelling and how it can it can lend itself to color to lighting to composition and to you know the economy of detail all of those things and then vice versa, you know, things I learned from outdoor painting, natural light, all of those things fed themselves into the, the uh, entertainment industry. You know, I leveraged off of both of those things. So I continue to do that. And for right now, uh, um, so back in August, I think is when we got to the point where um, I was finishing up on a show uh, that I was working on and it was coming to an end. And because of COVID at the time, a lot of a lot of the big names, you know, in the studio, a lot of artists, you know, that I respect. I started noticing they were just one by one. They were leaving the studio and they were headed over to Netflix and Sony and other places. And I was thinking, okay, this isn't good. I I noticed that there's a downtrend here and a lot of people are starting to leave and I I see the pattern emerging. I get what's going on because of COVID. Uh, And so eventually I had my meeting. They said, look, you know, just a heads up, you know, that it, it looks like, you know, we don't know what's next for you here. We're coming to the end of this, but of course we would love to keep you here. We'd be, you know, we'd love what you've done here. And I, and I love doing what I was doing there. But in essence, they just said, you know, at the moment, it, it, things are getting slim. They're getting very slim. And a lot of people, you know, you've seen them go. Uh, but they were looking to other, you know, outlets for me, like, you know, maybe you could do something in that painting. Maybe you could do this over here and there. And, you know, and at the time, you know, we, we, we explored some of those things, but ultimately in the end, it was a good opportunity for me to do something I haven't done in many, many years, which is to kind of really take some time off and, and, and focus on family for one, you know, cause you dedicate so much, you know, for me, it was always dedicating a whole bunch of time to DreamWorks and that animation, which takes up most of your time as a production designer or an art director, or even just a, a, a visual development artist. And also doing my plein air work on the side workshops and, and, uh, uh, events. 
uh, that took up pretty much all of my time. And then I got to think to myself, well, what about my life? You know, what about my family? And what about what I want to do? So I thought maybe that, you know, for COVID, you know, given the, the circumstances, this is probably a good time to hit the pause button for a little bit, you know, and take some time away from the studio and focus on my own personal work, focus on my health, you know, focus on, you know, relaxing and uh, focus on my personal work, you know, as a plein air artist. Um, I kind of felt like, sure, with, with all of these things juggled at the same time, I can kind of, you know, move forward as an artist. But if I finally get a chance to take a few months off and focus on plein air or studio work, uh, that's going to be great. And it's been tremendous. Uh, it's been so fantastic. I've been able to, you know, now spend hours and hours, you know, uh, painting in the studio or going out and painting on location and being able to kind of get myself to the other side of things that I wasn't able to get to the other side of before, such as, you know, the risks uh, that you normally don't feel comfortable taking in, in the uh, studio painting, you know, for an example, um, how to start painting beyond the photograph or how to start leveraging off of the things I've learned as a plein air painter when I'm painting from photos, because obviously with the pandemic, we weren't going out and we weren't painting from life as much, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, some of that was happening, but most of the time I ended up just kind of saying, well, you know, I, so much for that trip to Italy, I guess what I'll do is I'll just download a picture of Italy from the internet and paint that. Yeah. Um, but then I guess what I have to do is leverage off of what I've learned as a plein air painter. What would I do? You know, what kind of colors would it, you know, I know what a photograph does. I know how it flat things and changes the colors. And I know that there's no high key lighting in it. And I know the composition, um, isn't sound. I know I'm not there to experience what the culture is and all the things that bleed into it. So it's forced me in the studio to try to take, you know, take it upon myself to leverage and trust that it's in there. And I, and then I know that I can pull it out. So, well, but now, but now you're been, climbing El Capitan without a rope. All right, so you've 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 <laughs> ju- you've jumped you've jumped into it full time, which I think is really exciting because it's it's um, you know it's going to be a big change for you, and it's really going to be wonderful. You talked about workshops, Eric, yeah. You're so good at analogies. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the perfect way to explain it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. So uh, you talked about workshops. You talk about teaching. You, you know, I learned some things from you. I'll, I'll, first off, a lot of things from you. When you came into to Austin and you did that that um, uh, online workshop that we had, and then you shot these videos on color and composition and so on, there, there are things that you touch on and things that you do that nobody else does. And I don't mean that in a derogatory oh, sense. It, it's, it is... Uh, a depth that just goes beyond what we typically see. And I think that's because of the rich experience that you've had in the cinematic world. And, you know, you talked about a, a, a one second frame, but you guys would spend weeks developing that one second frame, you know, develop, developing the composition and the color and the light. And I can remember uh, buying books, um, you know, after films have been released, I went to a lot of animated films when my kids were smaller and, and I would buy the books because the lighting was so different and so, um, spectacular. So what is it that you would say, how, how could you articulate what you're teaching differently when you're out there teaching workshops? What kinds of things are you focusing on? And can you give us a couple of tips that might be able to be something we can uh, try to apply to our own work? I know it's hard to do that with audio instead of showing us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you, by the way, you know, for what you said, that's, you know, quite a compliment coming from you. Um, but yeah, you know, the things I strive for, so for, you know, it depends on what kind of, you know, workshop I'm teaching, you know, when it's only a three day workshop, there's only highlights you can give people, you know, in the moment and you have to kind of figure out how to distill all of the things you want to tell these people and teach them, you know, and, and break it down and distill it to three days. Uh, three days worth of information um, and how do you give it to them and how do you do it without not giving them too much information? Cause in the beginning of my workshops, it was always too much information. You know, I only have you for three days. So here's a whole bunch of information. And I learned that some of that is good, but that's also overwhelming. And especially for people who are maybe beginners and they're going to get out there. I think what you want to do, and this is how I've changed my, you know, it, it's evolved is you want to make it simple, you know, make it as simple and approachable 
and less intimidating as possible because in reality, that's the way it should be. In reality, when you become a seasoned painter, the paintings that have more simplicity in them and more and, and are distilled tend to be the ones that we react to the most, you know? Um, and there's a distilled message and there's, there's a hierarchy to what's most important to them in there when they learn to distill. I feel that most people when they get into landscape is that they're overwhelmed by too much information and they don't know where to start, you know, uh, when it comes to a landscape, they're thinking already, they're thinking of the details and the, all the literal things that are bogging them down and they become a prisoner uh, to their subject, you know, and, and um, they're binded to all of the things that they're holding on to too tight, like the things, I always call them the things, like never paint the things, just paint the broadness of form, paint the broadness and the simplicity of color. And then find an area where you maybe want to focus a little bit more attention, you know, when you're painting. But I'll see beginning artists start off and they're painting and they'll start imitating the texture of the tree or, or trying to paint every brick on the building. And I'm thinking, no, it's not necessary to have to be so, so uh, um, tied to the details when, in fact, less is always going to be more in painting. You know, the more you put into the painting the less the viewer is going to see. And I had students have a hard time understanding that. And I would explain it to them by saying, well, look, you know, I'll give you an example of, of what I'm talking about. You know, I remember I went to Trailside Galleries in, in Scottsdale, and I'm sure you're familiar with them. Well, it's a great gallery. Um, yeah. Yes. And uh, a person I met at DreamWorks who once came down to do a workshop for us, his name was Bill Anton. I'm sure you know who he is oh, as yeah. well. We had him one at the Plenary Convention. The great, yeah. yeah. One of the greats. One of the great, he changed so many things for me when he came into DreamWorks to do a demo. Because one of our art directors saw him in, uh, um, on, uh, um, I forgot what event they went to. They were painting a seascape, some Catalina Island. And they saw him doing this beautiful seascape, <laughs> like nothing, you know. And they're like, we, would, would you come down and do a demo for us at Art Center? And I mean, I'm sorry, not Art Center, DreamWorks. So he came down and, and he changed so many things for me because he came in and I was thinking when he was going to do an oil painting of some, you know, he invented a high Sierra landscape with a lake, very, you know, uh, uh, Edgar Payne ish, you know, but in his own way, he, uh, uh, he painted everything with uh, like the acrylic brushes, you know? And I was thinking, that's really odd. I thought he used bristle and he probably does use bristle, but for that particular demo he was doing, he was using acrylic brushes and he changed my approach to oil painting, which was he used a lot of, of, uh, um, um, uh, the liquid or liquid, what do you call it? The turpenoid, um, yeah. or Gamsol. turpentine, but Gamsol, Gamsol, thank you. Cause I don't paint that oil that much. I forget the Gamsol. He used a lot more. So I look at, if, if you guys are familiar with his paintings, they're, they come off as very, very thick, you know, very textural, but to see him painted and execute it, you know, with like an, a, a very lean, lean uh, approach in the beginning by using more Gamsol in the beginning and painting it wetter and leaner, it actually allows it to build up more, which is interesting, as opposed to starting off with thick paint and trying to put more thick on top of thick. It's almost like trying to put butter on butter. It doesn't work. And then he just comes in with this beautiful like uh, um, palette knife and then just starts messing everything up. That's what we thought. He was like, oh, he's messing it up. He's going in, he's scumbling all over this thing. But in, in, and in fact, he's just, he's bringing things together by doing that. So by pulling those colors together, loosening up the edges and having colors kind of skip into other colors, started building a tapestry effect but but he uh he was uh, one of those people that just kind of you know came in and and taught me something but anyway i'm getting off the subject the question was about tra uh, I was, the story i was going to tell you was about trailside gallery so i'm at the trailside gallery so i'm teaching a workshop down there um and um i go in and i take my students at lunch break i say let's go take a take a look at this gallery and we walk into trailside and of course there is this you know you know there's all kinds of amazing paintings there was this one painting from an artist who did this really, you know, from floor to ceiling, gorgeous painting of um, the Grand Canyon. And, but that artist used probably like a triple odd brush, you know, to paint every single detail, every crevice, every rock from the foreground to the background. Respectfully, it was overwhelmingly, you know, like, like what it must have taken to do that was just, you know, uh, beyond words to, to paint it that detailed but painted everything, every color, every texture, every rock. And there was a lot to be respected from that painting. It was glorious. It was pretty neat. However, the painting next to it was Bill Anton. And his painting was uh, almost about the same size, 
but had maybe about 60 per, uh, 60 less detail in his painting and it did enough you know it, it's it's it was easier to get to what it was Bill Anton was saying in that painting. It was like, boom, more immediate. And it really rang home like, wow, okay, there is something to the essence of kind of only distilling it down to the most important things, the most important marks and colors and shapes. So when I teach, it's always that essence, like guys don't get, don't get so pulled into having to paint everything and don't paint everything from left to right with the same amount of detail and color find an area where it's most important you know don't do what the camera can do don't do what the photograph does you know have your hierarchy what's the most important area you know where do you want your colors to sing a little bit more where do you want your contrast um why did you paint that uh tree parallel to the other tree well the students will say well because it's there i said so you're letting the landscape dictate what's right for you you know again get in there and you become, you know, basically the ambassador to the, to the image. You have total control of what's in front of you. You don't want that tree there, take it out. Or if you want it bigger, put it over here. You know, if, if you like uh, a brighter highlight on the water or something different, try to do that there, but justify it. Figure out how it counterbalances in real lighting. That's a hard if lesson like to learn, colors, though. It's, everything it, else. it's a hard lesson to learn to, to, to edit. It is, and it comes from years of mileage, but it also comes from years of taking those risks. So that's why I tell students, look, if you want to get there faster, stay away from all the literal stuff. Don't get bogged down by the literal. Start painting more broadly. Use a giant, uncomfortably large brush. That's rule number one. Just a huge brush that you're not comfortable with using. That'll help you simplify and get rid of the other stuff. Rule number two is paint smaller studies, but paint more of them, you know? You're better off painting, if you have five hours in a day to go out and, and learn, you're better off painting five one-hour studies as opposed to one five-hour study. Now, that's not the case for an advanced seasoned painter. You can go out and paint whatever size you'd like. And you can get it. But for the beginner, the beginner only has what I call and what I've learned over the years of teaching this stuff is the 45-minute window learning period. You're only going to learn what you're going to learn for the most part in a given in a given. Uh, uh, painting uh 45 minutes to keep it fresh after 45 minutes you're going to lose some of the the freshness you need to change the painting and go on to another one that's not to say that there's going to be times throughout the week you're just going to need to stay on one painting for a few hours and just get to the other side of it but there's also something to be said about finding a way to uh, uh to pace yourself and do more smaller paintings smaller palette less detail a larger brush a smaller time frame will give you that simplicity. And when you see the simplicity and the broadness, uh, what evolves from that is the ability to edit and is the, a better ability. You Small. won't get that from going out there for edit for hours and hours painting a giant painting. Smaller palette, I assume you mean fewer colors. Fewer colors. So, yes. Yeah. More colors can get you into more trouble when you're a beginner. Not yeah. when you're advanced, but as a beginner. And you'll even find that some advanced painters also have a very small palette as well. You know, I, I tend to kind of, I, I never usually have more than like, you know, 10 colors on a palette. Uh, and sometimes I might paint with only four or five colors, you know. And in fact, some of my most favorite paintings, like the Edgar Paynes, you know, that you'll see in a gallery, those paintings, you look at them uh, and there, there's not that much color in there. They're sophisticated color, but there's not a lot. You know, more color doesn't make a better painting. It's well, how you use that color. You were talking about mud the other day and, and the value of mud. And one, one thing that's taken me a while to understand is that some of the most beautiful paintings are all gray. You know, variations of gray, yeah. but they're all gray. And then they have a spot of color in the, in the um, focal point. And boy, it works. And it still makes the whole thing feel like it's colorful. Absolutely. You know, and if you have, you, know, you got to kind of think of what saturation is, you know, how, there's, there's two things to consider. Full saturation uh, brings things forward, always brings things forward. And what, we, what is it we're trying to, uh, we're trying to um, achieve in painting? We're trying to get depth. So how deep can you get when you're using too much saturation and too much color? You know, not to say that you don't want to use saturation and color, but, you know, because you want, you want the push and pull of saturation, desaturation, warm and cool, right? you know, more detail in the foreground, less detail in the background. All of those things uh, are tricks to giving you uh, depth in a painting. 
grays are another one of those things that can give you that kind of depth, you know, where they kind of, they push back, you know, into the painting. And then as you saturate colors, or especially if you go warmer, that pulls things forward in the painting. So you always got that push and pull effect, you know, that's going on in there, you know, and um, the other, I forgot what the other principle was. <laughs> I got lost on my thought there, but I, I think that's one of the most important, you know, critical aspects for me. Well, this could go on and on and on. This is so valuable. It does. We'll probably yeah. have I'm, to. I'm getting lost in my thoughts. <laughs> no, no, but we'll have to do this again sometime because th there's so much depth here. I'd encourage everybody to pick up your video, uh, which uh, you can find online just by searching your, your name and, and video. But uh, uh, there's two really good ones, and they really go into a lot of depth of this, and I think that would be really terrific. Mike, any final thoughts before we head out? Yeah, yeah. Um... As, as exciting as this is and, and exciting you know, and as excited as I am about talking about a lot of these things, I have such a long way to go, you know, um, a long way to go in, in learning what I do, especially when I look at the work that I see from my friends on social media and their paintings, it's humbling, you know, and that's one of the most amazing aspects of social media now is we have access to what everybody's painting that day, you know, yeah. right at that moment, we get to see what they're doing. And it's, it's wonderful uh, to be able to see people like that. And so I'm always inspired. And I'm always inspired by everything that you're doing, Eric, and the opportunities that you're giving people by having podcasts like this. Uh, and by trying to, you know, you know, do what we're doing with pace and all of these other things. It's, it's uh, a big thank you to you for everything that you're doing to try to keep us all inspired. Appreciate it. Well, that's very kind. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being on the Plein Air podcast. Oh, thank you for having me, Eric. It's been a pleasure. Mike Hernandez is so thoughtful. Thank you, Mike, uh, for what a great interview. Really has so many good things to say. I think we could have probably talked for hours, and maybe we'll have him back again someday. All right. We've got a couple of great videos that Mike Hernandez has created. You can find them at Streamline Art. Okay, you guys ready for some art marketing ideas? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art. Proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. And in the Marketing Minute, I answer your art marketing questions. Yours can become uh, part of the broadcast if you email me, eric at artmarketing.com. We also have our own art marketing podcast. It's the uh, same content that we just push out as a separate podcast. And so if you don't want to listen to Plein Air podcast, or if you want the marketing, you can just go there. Now, here's a question from John. O'Neill in Albany, New York, who says, I'm finally ready to start a website and a newsletter. My question is, does it need a catchy title or something that's more direct, like my name? Well, John, I think, you know, uh, in my book, Make More Money Selling Your Art, a whole, a whole thing on websites. And that's something you want to check out. But essentially, you've got to, first off, everybody says, well, I have to have a website. Well, do you? You know, the web is changing and things are changing a lot. Now, the question is, before you even create a website, you have to ask yourself, what's my strategy? Why am I creating a website? What do I have? Uh, what do I hope to have happen with that website? Is my website a branding tool, a way to show my artwork? Is it a way to sell my artwork? Is it all of the above? What is the 80 percenter? What is the one thing that you really want to focus on? And, and try to figure that out before you decide if you're going to start a website. Because quite frankly, nowadays, you can kind of do almost the same thing with Facebook and Instagram. And uh, there's also a lot of other things that are trending. So you may want to ask yourself, is this really necessary anymore? Now, there's a lot of people out there that make uh, great websites and, you know, you can kind of make your own through them. And some of them are art specific and some of them are not. You're going to have to decide what works for you. But do you need a catchy title or something that's more direct? Well, you know, uh, catchy titles can be uh, risky. Uh, you know, if you were, um, you know, remember Thomas Kincaid, the painter of light. I mean, that was a catchy title. And but and, and then for a long time, everybody was, you know, the painter of this and the painter of that. But I'm not so sure it really meant anything. You know, what, you, what you've got to do is figure out what is the focus? <clears throat> what do I really want to spend my time doing? The big mistake that I think artists make when they're trying to market themselves is they try to be too many things to too many people. They try to do too many styles or they try to do too many subject matter. Figure out first what it is you want. So if you are going to be a catchy title or if you're maybe it doesn't even have to be catchy, it might just be, you know, John O'Neill landscape painter. Or it might be John O'Neill ocean painter, seaside painter, 
or whatever it is you're good at, you know, something because we can't all be good at everything and you want to kind of get known for something. So first thing I think is, you know, put your name up there, John O'Neill. And then, uh, then if you want to say, have a subhead that is uh, kind of an explainer, you know, a subhead explainer is like Coca-Cola and then it says the real thing, right? So I don't know if that means anything anymore, but it did it maybe at one time. So you, you've got to think about that. But no, your name is fine and people are going to Google your name and you want them to uh, find you. And this is an opportunity to brand yourself. Now, one mistake I think a lot of people make is they love, they fall in love with their signature and they put this big unreadable signature at the top of their website. Now, that's okay. That's okay if you also put your name on top of it in text that somebody can read. But a lot of people can't read that stuff. Everybody thinks they can. And, you know, there's nothing worse than a signature that nobody can read. At least put your name on the back of the painting, too. We'll have a whole other thing on the back of the painting sometime. Anyway, hope that helps, John. Here's a question from Jeffrey Skelton in Nashville, Tennessee, who says, I'm always hearing about new scams. Are there any traps that artists can be aware of and avoid? Well, Jeffrey, I'm not the guy. You know, this is a marketing podcast, but let me just tell you what I know. And I don't know much, but I have been um, approached many times from someone. It's always a different name. It's always a different email. But the, the email goes something like this. I was looking at your website. I'm trying to find something really special for my wife for her birthday, our anniversary, you know, some, some particular thing. And I found a particular painting. I'd like to buy it from you. Can we make arrangements? And so here's how the scam I'm told works. And that is, uh, that, you know, they, they say they want to send you a check and uh, then you send them the painting and then uh, the check doesn't clear. So uh, first off, if they're saying those words, chances are it's a scam. But secondly, you know, you can hammer the check. You can go to the bank and you can say, I'm not going to send this until the check clears. Now, one of the other things they do is they, uh, they overpay. So let's say your painting is a thousand dollars. They send you $1,500 and then they send, you know, they send the check and then they overpay. And then there's some way that they, uh, cancel the check and they manipulate it or something. And, and as a result, uh, they're getting $500 cash out of that transaction when they had no intent of paying. Uh, if you want to read up on art scams, I would probably check out, I think the FBI has a, uh, an art scamming division. You might want to check that out, but you know, if something sounds too good to be true, it is, it always is. So, uh, just keep that in mind. Anyway, this has been the Marketing Minute. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. Well, a reminder to sign up for plenairlive.com. Since we're not having the convention this year, this is your time. And, and um, you know, we make it pretty entertaining. We have a lot of fun. And we have uh, a gathering of artists for a very reasonable price. And, and it's amazing. And if you can't make the dates, you can watch the replays. There's different lengths of uh, different dates on replays. And so you can do that. Also, make sure that you get signed up and get your entries in, uh, your best paintings for the year or for the past 10 years, it doesn't matter. Uh, Register at plenairsalon.com, but get it done by March 15th. The big awards are coming on Plen Air Live. We're also going to do a Lifetime Achievement Award on Plen Air Live for uh, artist Joanna Arnett. So if you've not seen my blog where I talk about life and art and other things, it's called Sunday Coffee, and you can find it for free at coffeewitheric.com and then subscribe to it so that you get it all the time. Well, it's always fun to do this. We'll do it again sometime like next week. We'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, the publisher and the founder of Plen Air Magazine. And you can find us online at outdoorpainter.com. Thanks for listening today, and I hope you have a terrific day. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plen Air Podcast with Plen Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plen Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email. Eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plen Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.